silence all electronic devices, and remove your proxy badges. Thank you. General Wilson, Lieutenant General Silveria, Colonel Anarumo, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am Cadet First Class Megan Vandermoss, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 22nd Annual Malham M. Waken Character and Leadership Development Award Presentation Ceremony. The United States Air Force Academy's Malham M. Waken Character and Leadership Development Award is a formal means of recognizing significant acts that are consistent with our Air Force's core values of integrity, service, and excellence. The award honors Brigadier General Malham M. Waken, United States Air Force retired, and is presented to the individual or team assigned to the academy who made the greatest contributions to cadet character and leadership development over the past year. The following areas were considered for the superintendent's overall selection. Conspicuous moral courage, great personal sacrifice, conduct above and beyond the requirements of duty, and leadership and professionalism in keeping with the highest ideals of Air Force tradition. Brigadier General Wakens' 50 plus years of developing leaders of character, teaching and mentoring, US Air Force Academy cadets, faculty and staff embody the very ideal of character development. Unfortunately, General Waken and his wife, Lynn, could not be with us today. But we would like to thank them for their continued support towards developing leaders of character here at the United States Air Force Academy. The Academy would also like to recognize and thank the USAFA class of 1974 for endowing the Waken Award, thereby ensuring the continued recognition of exemplary character development in leaders at the Academy. Would those representing the class of 1974 please stand and be recognized. This year's nominees for the Waken Award stem from several different mission elements across the Academy. Representing the cadet wing is Major Lewis Nolting, who is unable to attend tonight. From the Dean of the Faculty, the late Lieutenant Colonel Camilo Guerrero. From the Athletic Department, Lieutenant Colonel Kaipo McGuire. Lastly, representing the Preparatory School, the team from the Department of Character, Culture, and Climate. At this time, I introduce Lieutenant General Jay Silveria, the Air Force Academy's 20th Superintendent, and Colonel Mark Anarumo, the Director and Permanent Professor of the Center for Character and Leadership Development, to present this year's Waken Award Medal. This year's recipient of the Malham M. Waken Character Award is Lieutenant Colonel Camilo Guerrero.
Lieutenant Colonel Camilo Guerrero was an important developer of leaders of character for the Air Force Academy and was also an exceptional leader of character himself. During his service as an assistant professor of behavioral sciences and leadership, he devoted himself to developing cadets as an instructor in the classroom, as a curriculum developer, as a coach and mentor, and as a respected role model. A 1996 graduate of the Air Force Academy, Colonel Guerrero was a recruiter and maintenance officer in the Air Force and served two tours on the Air Force Academy faculty. His recent academic contributions included building lessons for the Academy's new officership course based on cutting edge behavioral science research. Colonel Guerrero was never afraid to employ innovative teaching practices for his cadets and he served as a valuable coach for new faculty instructors teaching for the first time. Despite his diagnosis with cancer, he aggressively sustained his work in support of cadet development, which included continuing to teach and grade between chemotherapy appointments and providing personal feedback to cadets from his hospital bed days before his passing. Colonel Guerrero passed away on 6 March 2018 at the age of 44. He was an inspiration to cadets and permanent party alike through his energy, brilliance, and commitment. Lieutenant Colonel Camilo Guerrero undeniably lived honorably, lifted others in elevated performance, the mark of a true leader of character. Here to receive the award in his honor is his wife, Jane Buckholtz, and their three sons, Che, Theo, and Aiden. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my privilege to transition to the keynote event of our 26th National Character and Leadership Symposium. Tonight's presentation is supported by the John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation and the class of 1973. It would not be possible without their incredible generosity and support. The John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation has financially supported this keynote lecture since 2004. If there are members of the class of 73 or the John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation, Will you please stand and be recognized? We would also like to recognize the United States Air Force Academy, class of 1959, the class of 1974, the class of 1993, the Association of Graduates, the Falcon Foundation, and the United States Air Force Academy Endowment. Will you please stand to be recognized? Thank you for your support in helping make NCLS possible. This year's distinguished speaker for the 2019 John and Lynn Muse Lecture is the Honorable Leon Panetta. Secretary Panetta served as the 23rd Secretary of Defense from July 2011 to February 2013. Before joining the Department of Defense, Secretary Panetta served as the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency from February 2009 to June 2011. He led the agency and managed the human intelligence and open source collection programs. From July 1994 to January 1997, Secretary Panetta served as Chief of Staff to President William Clinton. Prior to that, he was Director of the Office of Management and Budget a position that built on his years of work on the House Budget Committee. Secretary Panetta represented California's 16th, now 17th, Congressional District from 1977 to 1993, rising to House Budget Committee Chairman during his final four years in Congress. Early in his career, Secretary Panetta served as a legislative assistant to Sen Senator Thomas H. Kekul of California. 
Special Assistant to the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Director to the U.S. Office for Civil Rights, and Executive Assistant to Mayor John Lindsay of New York. He also spent five years in private law practice. He served as an Army Intelligence Officer from 1964 to 1966 and received the Army Commendation Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Leon Panetta. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Cadet Vandermoss. Ban I really appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, my thanks to General uh, Silveria and also to Colonel Cantwell for hosting me and also to thank uh, John Muse and uh, his daughter Whitney for their support for this great program. It is, uh, it's truly an honor for me to have the opportunity to uh, participate in this distinguished character and leadership symposium. And I'm honored for several reasons. Honored because as Secretary of Defense, I was incredibly proud of all of our military academies. They are, without question, one of the best investments we make in the future security of our nation. As Secretary, as Director of the CIA, I always believed that my primary mission was to protect our country. That mission could not be accomplished without the dedicated service of the over two million men and women in uniform who are willing to put their lives on the line in order to keep our nation safe. And you, the cadets in the audience, as future military officers, you will lead that mission of keeping our country safe. You will be supported by some of the most advanced and sophisticated technologies and weapon systems of the 21st century, fighters, the F-35, the F-22, new bombers, missiles, unmanned systems, drones, cyber, artificial intelligence, new space capabilities, the very best in technology that we have in the 21st century. But let me tell you something. None of that technology is worth a damn without the leadership of our men and women in uniform. You, the future warriors of America, you remain our greatest weapon. I'm also honored to be here at the Air Force Academy because this academy is responsible for producing those future warriors. You will be responsible for ensuring American air superiority in a very dangerous world of adversaries and enemies who are competing with us every day and who continue to threaten the security of our country. Since 9-11, you are witness to the longest stretch of combat in our nation's history. Without question, you could have chosen a different path, a different college, a different profession, a different career. But you chose service to country. And by making that choice, you passed the first test of leadership. 
whether you train to become pilots or remote pilots or space officers or combat systems officers, missileers, intelligence officers, engineers, your leadership will be essential to ensuring that our nation has the strongest air force on the face of the earth. And finally, I'm honored because you are now part of a long legacy of air superiority that stretches back to World War II. As Congressman, I had the honor of representing a very distinguished airman, Jimmy Doodlittle. And some of you will recall Jimmy Doodlittle headed up the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo soon after Pearl Harbor. It was a courageous effort to try to boost the spirit of our country after it had been brutally attacked. I remember when I asked him about that experience, he gave me some pretty good advice. Never be afraid to do your best. Never be afraid to do your best. And he recalled for me the simple mission of his crew. And I quote, go in, do your job, and get the hell out. I never forgot those words. When I had to issue the order for the raid on bin Laden, I told Admiral Bill McRaven, I said, Bill, go in, get bin Laden, and get the hell out. I was inspired by Jimmy Doolittle and the heroism of the past. And you too will carry that history with you. The Doolittle Raid, the bombing runs over Germany, the dogfights over the Pacific, the Enola Gay, MiG Alley in Korea, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, 70,000 sorties of Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and the missions over Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and the achievements in space. That history is part of the American story. And you, as future Air Force officers, will write the next chapter of that story, the next chapter of the American dream. I'm the son of Italian immigrants. And they, like millions of others, came to this country in the early 1930s. And I remember asking my father, as a young boy, why would you travel all of that distance to come to a strange land? They came from a poor area in Italy, but they had the comfort of family and of friends. Why would you leave all of that to come to America? And I never forgot his response. He said, because your mother and I believed that we could give our children a better life in this country. That, my friends, is the American story. It is the American dream. And you are now part of that dream. Well, my parents also taught me that dreams are just dreams. Unless you're willing to fight to make those dreams come true, to work hard, to sacrifice, to take risks, to never give up, 
to keep fighting. I once had a, a Jesuit at Santa Clara University who said to me, Leon, God gives you life, but it's up to you to make a life. And he then told a story that I often tell because of the wonderful point it makes, the story of the rabbi and the priest who decided that they would get to know each other and as a result of that, know each other's religion. So they would go to different events, hoping that would give them the opportunity to talk about their different religions. One evening they went to a boxing match. And just before the bell rang, one of the boxers made the sign of the cross. And the rabbi nudged the priest and said, what does that mean? The priest said, it doesn't mean a damn thing if he can't fight. <laughs> now my friends, we bless ourselves with the hope that everything will be fine in this country. But very frankly, it doesn't mean a damn thing unless we're willing to fight for it. That, that willingness to fight is part of the values that are ingrained in our country the values of our forefathers, of the pioneers, of the immigrants, values of love of country, love of freedom, of honesty, of respect for one another, of sacrifice. Those are the values that make the United States the greatest country on the face of the earth. And you, as future leaders, must embrace those values because that is why you are defending this country. You're defending our country against those enemies who are seeking to undermine the very values that make us Americans. That is what protecting the security of America in the 21st century is all about. I often tell the students at our Panetta Institute, an institute that my wife and I founded over 20 years ago to try to inspire young people to lives of public service. And I tell them that in our democracy, we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, we can avoid crisis. But if leadership is not there, and make no mistake about it, we will operate by crisis. If leaders are unwilling to take the risks out of fear or doubt or ambivalence, then crisis will be the inevitable result. And of course you can lead that way. You can just get by, you can play it safe, you can move paper from the inbox to the outbox. You can blame others when the mission fails. But there's a price to be paid and that price is you lose the trust of the people you are responsible to lead. And very frankly, trust is everything. Let me be clear. I believe in American leadership because I believe that the real strength of our nation is in our people, in you, men and women, who are willing to fight and, yes, die if necessary for your country. God knows we have faced crisis throughout the history of our country, 
civil wars, world wars, natural disasters, a brutal terrorist attack on 9-11. But somehow we have always risen to the occasion. Somehow we have always found that inner strength. And it's because of you, our most powerful weapon. You embody the American spirit, our sense of resilience, of common sense, of courage, of dedication to duty, to teamwork, to never giving up, and yes, to fight and keep fighting to protect our nation. As secretary, I saw those values up close. I saw them on the battlefields of Iraq and, and Afghanistan. I saw them in faraway air bases, intelligence stations, remote military outposts. I looked into the eyes of our warriors and saw that deep commitment to mission and to duty. And I've seen what can be accomplished when leaders are willing to lead. The best example I can give you is from my own experience with the raid on bin Laden. And I tell you about that operation because I think from it you can draw some very basic lessons about what leadership is all about and what it takes to accomplish a difficult mission. When I became director of the CIA, the president made clear to me that my most important mission was to get bin Laden. For 10 years, every lead had led nowhere. No one was sure whether he was living in a cave in Afghanistan or in the tribal areas of Pakistan or somewhere in Iran or whether, in fact, he might be dead. Which brings me to the first lesson. The first lesson is to always establish a clear mission. I ordered my staff to set up a team to focus on nothing else but to find, capture, or kill bin Laden. And I required them to brief me on that mission every week. I made clear it was unacceptable to report no progress. I told them, don't come in here if you're going to say, we haven't been able to find anything. I want four or five new ideas every time you come into my office. For over eight months, we worked every possibility. We followed family members who were under house arrest in Iran. We analyzed the sounds in every bin Laden tape listening for bird sounds or bells or any sounds that could give us some hint of where he might be located. We used classified technology to try and penetrate his computers. We developed new spies. We used old spies. We worked with our allies. Jordan, the nation of Jordan, developed a source that they thought could lead us to bin Laden. Unfortunately, that source turned out to be a double agent who, when we were set up a meeting to check the credibility of the source, set off a suicide vest that killed seven CIA officers. But finally, we pieced together intelligence that identified the couriers for bin Laden. 
We put faces to the names. And that was a major breakthrough because we located them in the town of Peshawar in Pakistan. Through surveillance, using your pilots, we tracked a white SUV from Peshawar to a compound in Abbottabad. Abbottabad is what's termed kind of a resort town north of the capital, Islamabad. And once we saw that compound, it immediately set off bells. The compound was three times the size of other compounds. It had 12-foot walls on one side, 18-foot walls on another side, 8-foot wall on the third floor, Bob wire at the top of those walls. A family was living on the third floor. We had looked at the clothes on the clothesline and identified the number in the family, which was similar to the number of family members in bin Laden's family. The couriers would go 90 miles away from that compound in order to make phone calls. So clearly, there was high security associated with the compound. We reported our find to the president. And we began more intensive 24-7 surveillance. Using a team made up of almost every intelligence agency and military resources, which, by the way, stresses another lesson of leadership. Teamwork, the ability to reach out and pull together all of the needed capabilities and resources and personnel, all working together on a common mission, absolutely critical to the ability to achieve any mission, is the ability to create that sense of teamwork. As we continued surveillance, what we noticed was that there was someone who was in somewhere between 50 or 60 years old, who would come out of the compound and walk in circles in the courtyard of the compound, like a prisoner in a prison yard. He became known as the Pacer. When I saw that, I told the people at the CIA, for God's sakes, that could be bin Laden. We need to get a facial ID, put a telescope on a mountain, put cameras on the walls. I don't give a damn what you have to do. We need to get a facial. And they said it was difficult. There are high walls on one side. We can't get a good picture. I said, you know, I've seen movies where the CIA can do this. <laughs> Unfortunately, they still couldn't find it. And so we continued to develop as much intelligence as we could. We put those pieces together. We, re we red teamed every conclusion to try to figure out what else this might be. And finally, the president concerned about the possibility that as we began to inform others within the administration, in the military, about our find, that that information might be compromised. And so we began planning an operation. I went to Admiral Bill McRaven, asked him to come over to the CIA so I could brief him on what we had found. And I told him about the compound. Bill's eyes lit up because he understood the significance of what we were going to do. Which brings me to another 
lesson that I think is important and that Bill McRaven did for me, which is to develop as many options as possible when you're looking at a mission that you're trying to accomplish. Bill presented three options. One was to take a B-2 bomber and basically blow the hell out of the place, which wasn't a bad idea, frankly. <laughs> the problem was that the amount, of, the amount of firepower required to level the compound would probably have taken down several villages in the nearby area. The second option was to do a drone strike on the pacer with a Hellfire missile. But there were concerns, not only about whether we could do a clean strike, but also about whether or not we would ever know whether or not it was Bin Laden. Which brought us to the third option, which was a commando raid, Neptune Spear. Two teams of SEALs on two helicopters going 150 miles at night into Pakistan, repelling into the compound. A compound, by the way, that as I said was located in Abbottabad, which is the location of the Pakistani West Point, and also both military and intelligence centers as well. Bottom line, a very risky mission, which raises another critical lesson of leadership, the courage to make risky decisions. I'm not talking about stupid decisions. I'm talking about the ability to know what the risks are when there is a clear mission that requires the ability of the military to accomplish. When we briefed the National Security Council on the options, a majority thought that the operation would be too risky. When the President asked me, I said, Mr. President, when I faced a tough vote in Congress, I used to ask myself, if I informed an average citizen in my district about that issue and asked what would that average citizen do, it helped me make a decision. It's my view that if I told that citizen that we had the best intelligence on the location of bin Laden since Tora Bora, that that average citizen would say we would have to go in. And that's what I'm telling you. And I also have tremendous confidence in the ability of these special forces to do the job, because it's a mission they sometimes did six, seven, eight times a night in Afghanistan. So for that reason, I would say it's important to go. It brings me to another critical lesson when it comes to this kind of mission, which is that you can't take anything for granted. You have to practice and plan for every contingency. The team practiced multiple times on a replica of the compound in order to make sure that they knew how that operation would go. The President didn't make a decision after that meeting, but the next morning I received a call that the President had decided to go. It was a tough decision. I immediately called Admiral McRaven and gave him the do-little order. Go in, get bin Laden, and get the hell out. And I also added, if you go in and bin Laden is not there, 
get the hell out. On May 1, 2011, a moonless night, we launched the operation. Since it was covert, I ran the operation out of CIA with Admiral McRaven located in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, with the team. We were providing a fee to the White House Situation Room. It took close to almost two hours for those helicopters to reach the compound. Unfortunately, because it had been a hot day that day, the heat from the ground came up and stalled one of the engines on one of the helicopters. And thank God there was an experienced warrant officer who was able to safely bring the copter down. The tail was up on a fence, but everybody was okay. I asked McRaven, what the hell is going on? Without missing a beat, he said, no problem. We've got a backup Chinook helicopter coming in. It was pre-positioned. The mission will go on, and instead of rappelling in, we'll breach the walls. McRaven followed another basic lesson. Look at all contingencies and have a backup plan. The team breached the walls. We heard gunfire as they entered the main compound. It was followed by 20 minutes of silence, the longest 20 minutes in my life. And then I heard the code word Geronimo, which was the code word for getting bin Laden. They proceeded to get vital intelligence in the compound. They blew up the helicopter, which is a, had a sensitive design. They held off the nearby villagers. They got the body, and they got the hell out. There was concern about whether the Pakistanis would scramble F-16s. But thankfully, they didn't do it, and our team made it back to Jalalabad. That night after the president announced the operation to the world, crowds gathered in Lafayette Park on the east side of the White House, and they were chanting USA, USA, CIA, CIA. It was a great moment for our nation because not only was the mission accomplished, but it sent a clear message to the world that nobody attacks the United States of America and gets away with it. These are the lessons of leadership. A clear message, a clear mission, teamwork, persistence, careful planning for all options, and contingencies, the courage to take risks, and the trust so important between a leader and their team. But most importantly, it was also about the humanity of each warrior. When Bill McRaven and I were briefing members of Congress on the operation after the raid, Bill described that when the team members reached the floor where bin Laden was located, two young girls were screaming. And the team put their arms around them and moved them to safety. A senator asked Bill, what was it in the training of those team members that taught them to push those young girls to safety? In a voice trembling with emotion, Bill said, Senator, these are special forces, but first they are people, people who value life, 
They have wives and kids and mothers and fathers. That's what taught them. There is no higher compliment than to say of these warriors that first they are people, people who value life. You are future officers in the United States Air Force. You will command incredible firepower against our enemies. But what makes you leaders, regardless of the enemy, is that you never lose sight of the value of life. Before I left the job as CIA director to become Secretary of Defense, I visited host Afghanistan, where we had lost those seven CIA officers to that suicide bomber. And I placed a plaque on the wall that had a verse from Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 8. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for me? And I said, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me. Send me. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the sound of the trumpet that calls all of us to duty. That's why you are here. That's why you are willing to go in harm's way. As secretary, I had no more solemn responsibility than to sign the deployment orders and send men and women into battle. And every time I signed those orders, I said a quiet Hail Mary and prayed that they would all be returned home safely. As we all know too well, those prayers are not always answered. I spent too much time going to Dover to greet the remains of our loved ones and to comfort their families and to try to never forget their sacrifice and the sacrifice of their families. But we fight on. We fight on because that is exactly what those who gave their lives would want us to do to fight on and to never give up until the mission is accomplished. You're the future leaders of the Air Force. Your duty is to fight to protect our nation. Anybody in the world, anybody in the world who wants to test our country's security must know the full weight of the words that you proudly sing in the Air Force song. Give her the gun. Give her the gun. And fight for the American dream. Fight for those values that make us who we are. And fight for a government of, by, and for all people. Yes. We will bless ourselves that America will always be safe. But frankly, it doesn't mean a damn thing unless we're willing to fight for it. God bless you, and God bless our country. Secretary Panetta, thank you for your timely and compelling message. It is our honor to present you this plaque on behalf of the United States Air Force Academy, our 2019 NCLS participants, and the entire cadet wing.
We once again extend our thanks to the USAPA Endowment, the Association of Graduates, the Class of 73, and all others who through their generosity make NCLS possible. Finally, a special thanks to the John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation for sponsoring this event. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this year's Waken Award Ceremony and John and Lynn Muse keynote lecture. Cadets, you are dismissed.